Hello, and thank you everyone for joining us for this WorkSource Academy training session. Um, today's topic is going to cover the equal opportunity and non-discrimination requirements under WIOA, um, and our plan is to sort of take it back to basics. So we hope that this presentation will serve as an introduction for any new equal opportunity officers around the state, um, but that it could also serve as a refresher for our more veteran staff in those roles. But first, let's start with some introductions. My name is Brittany Sanger, and I'm the Compliance Director here at TCSG's Office of Workforce Development. Um, I also serve as the state-level EO officer for Title I programs under WIOA. Um, and I also have with me today Karen Abron. Uh, Karen is a Compliance Specialist here at OWD, but prior to joining us here, she worked at a local area as a Programs Manager. And most pertinent to our topic today, she was also the local EO officer um, for that area. So she's got some, some good insight and perspective to give, um, but let's go ahead and get started. So since we're going back to basics, the best place to start is by looking at the governing citations and the federal entities responsible for enforcement of these provisions. So as a federally funded program, there are some important requirements regarding the provision of WIOA services in a non-discriminatory way. Um, as such, WIOA Section 188 covers very generally those required prohibitions regarding discrimination in WIOA programs. Um, so on this slide, you'll see, just as a reminder, we've included the list of protected classes. Um, now, we won't be going into great detail around these and what all is covered under those, um, but there is a presentation presentation linked at the end of our PowerPoint from the EEOC. Um, there's a whole references slide that I'll be pointing to throughout this presentation. So I encourage you to, to take a look at that if you're interested in diving more into what all is covered um, and for more information about those protected classes. Um, but the US Department of Labor Civil Rights Center is the main federal entity that we interact with in this space. Um, they're responsible for enforcing section 188 um, and just as a note, I put it on here that they interpret those WIOA provisions to be consistent with the Americans with Disabilities Act, as well as the as various sections of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, and I point this out just to highlight that there are various federal entities involved in this piece of WIOA implementation, um, which should really highlight the importance of ensuring that all of the services we provide and interactions that we have really fall in line with these requirements. And obviously I wanna say, you know, I, I have faith that all of the local areas across the state are indeed delivering services in a non-discriminatory way, but it's just so important for us to make sure that we have the appropriate processes and assurances in place to be able to identify potential issues, you know, resolve them without harm to anyone, um, you know, and ensure we can, we're doing all we can to meet those requirements. Um, of course, not only is it the law, it's, it's just the right thing to do. So moving on from the language actually in the law, the, the next place that we look at for, you know, the EO and non-discrimination requirements is the Code of Federal Regulations. And these are the more detailed rules for actually implementing um, these steps. The citations are listed on this slide. Um, and again, the direct link to this is included on the references slide at the end of the PowerPoint. You know, we've talked a little bit about the federal entities involved in this, but then, of course, as a recipient of WIOA Title I funds, TCSG, Office of Workforce Development, is the state entity responsible for ensuring compliance with these regulations, which we do through the development and implementation of the non-discrimination plan, which we'll talk about shortly. And then, of course, through continued technical assistance, which can be, you know, in various forms, uh, including, you know, responding to individual questions, developing training materials like this one, um, or bringing in various presenters at our conferences. Um, in the past, we've had folks like the EEOC, and then David Dietrichs has come and done a presentation as well. Um, and that's something we'll continue to offer. So as you have questions, as you encounter unique situations, please send those to us, let us know what we can do to help and, and we'll develop whatever you know training materials we can. This is also something that we pay close attention to in our annual monitoring. Both the compliance and programs teams evaluate 
you know, local policies and procedures, as well as the grievance form template, and then the process for providing that form to participants. So, you know, we're looking at all those areas to make sure that the process is being followed in the local area, participants are aware of their rights, and that the process is, is really working the way it's intended to. So in compliance with WIOA requirements, our office developed um, and maintains the non-discrimination plan. And this basically is just the document that describes the state's actions to ensure all the requirements are met in you know, availability, access, and delivery of services in WIOA Title I programs across the state. So on this slide, you'll see that we've listed the main components covered in that plan. Um, and again, because this is a back to basics training, we didn't want to spend all of our time covering the ins and outs of that plan as, as it can be quite dense. But I do encourage you guys to take a look at it for um, some more detailed information and, and let us know what questions you have. But basically, it covers the you know, required assurances that need to be included on all of your job training plans, your contracts, MOUs, um, and any other agreement. It goes over the roles and responsibilities of the EO officers, talks about the required elements for all forms of notice and communication. And then this plan also covers requirements around data collection, maintenance, record keeping, affirmative outreach, as well as the complaint processing procedures for both general complaints as well as complaints alleging discrimination. And then the final topic it covers is the state's oversight responsibilities. Again, I encourage you to read through that at your leisure. Um, and this is another document that's linked at the end of our PowerPoint. So before I turn it over to Karen, um, I wanted to briefly touch on the state level EO officer responsibilities. So in this role, myself and my team work to ensure that the WIOA Title I services across the state are compliant with the non-discrimination requirements. In doing that, we issue and maintain, like I've stated already, the non-discrimination plan. Um, there's a portion of our policy that covers the complaint process. And then we've also issued a WIG on this topic as well. So any, any guidance related to this area um, is something that my team handles. Um, of course, you know, in monitoring, we coordinate the reviews and evaluations for all the local areas to ensure that those policies are, are meeting the requirements. And then we also work with both the Georgia Department of Labor's Equal Opportunity Administrator, um, as well as the U.S. Department of Labor Civil Rights Center. You know, we can ask them technical assistance questions. They approve our non-discrimination plan. So we reach out to them as needed um, in, in this space. And then, of course, if any complaints come to the state office, my team is responsible for completing all of the administrative duties related to processing those complaints. We loop in the TCSG legal team as needed um, or other parties um, and just handle all aspects of processing those complaints. So I'm going to turn it over to Karen to talk a little bit about the local EO officers. Thank you, Brittany. Local EO officers. The LWDA director is required to designate the equal opportunity officer. This appointment does not require board approval. The roles and responsibilities of the EO officer are not limited to the following duties. Inform senior level staff of applicable federal regulations and ensure all programs and activities are implemented in compliance. Process, resolve, or refer all complaints when appropriate. Ensure all applicants and employees receive a copy of the EO notice and all required postings are maintained. Ensure policies and procedures are in compliance. Coordinate with state level EO officer as needed and ensure that facilities, programs, service, information, and equipment are accessible to individuals with disabilities. Notice and communication. The regulations lay out the required notice and communication regarding an individual's rights and ability to file a complaint. These requirements include to whom the notice should be provided, the required tagline, equal opportunity is the law, all publications, broadcasts, and other forms of communication. For example, the LWDA's website and printed brochures auxiliary aids and TDD, TTY services are available upon request to individuals with disabilities. During orientation for new participants, customers, 
and new employees should include a discussion of their rights to non-discrimination and equal opportunity, including the right to file a complaint. Required information on the grievance form. Local EO officers name, title, address, phone number, and TDD, TTY services. State level EO officer name is not required. Also, the email address is not required, but it is a good practice to include the email address. And that is WIOA compliance at tcsg.edu. The email tagline can also be found in the reference area at the end of the presentation under contact us. I will turn this presentation back to Brittany and she will discuss engaging with complainants. Uh, thank you, Karen. So in addition to covering the requirements surrounding equal opportunity and non-discrimination, um, we also wanted to offer some tips and best practices in this space. So in terms of engaging with complainants, we, we have some tips on this slide here. Um, you know, by definition, folks coming to us with concerns in this area ha have a grievance. Um, they're likely upset by the way they've been treated or how they perceive they've been treated. Um, maybe they've been denied a service that they genuinely thought they were entitled to. You know, when they come to us, they could be very upset, angry, disappointed, um, a whole range of emotions. And while at the outset of taking their complaint, we might know that this you know, won't amount to anything, that it may not reach the level um, of a grievance, um, or that there was potentially a miscommunication that can be easily resolved, um, we should approach each situation with care. And I'll use the phrase that I always use in my, my customer service days, that the customer is not always right, but they deserve to be heard. So as we're taking complaints, you know, it's always important to remember to stay calm. Um, if someone's upset, I would advise you not to match their energy. You know, give them a smile, a listening ear, and nine times out of 10, that's gonna bring them down to a more calm level and make that interaction much more positive. Um, of course, you know, be sincere when you're talking to them, let them know that you're there to listen to their concerns and that you'll do everything you can to um, you know, resolve the issue or to get them answers or, or whatever um, you can to make sure that there's a, a satisfactory outcome to this situation. Uh, I also find it best to avoid any jargon. You know, we're all familiar with WIOA being alphabet soup and it's sometimes its own language, but to a complainant, it might be uh, confusing to hear WIOA specific terms. Um, so I advise everyone to, you know, talk to them and explain the process in layman's terms. We, we don't want anyone to feel like they're getting the runaround or to feel overwhelmed by the process because we're talking about it in this overly formal way. Of course, you know, there's a formal process that we need to follow, but if we could just make sure that we're explaining it clearly, I think that that would, um, you know, allay of a lot of anxiety that complainants may have during this process. So as you're taking their complaint or discussing the problem with them, um, I find it best to practice active listening, um, which involves repeating back or paraphrasing what they've told you. And, and this just ensures that you're able to get all the details right, that you, know, you, you can repeat back to them what they said, and if you got a detail wrong, they can correct you um, in that moment, and you can make sure that what you're documenting is the, the full story. Uh, and of course, you know, just letting them tell their story and withholding any judgment or advice until the appropriate time. So once you have all of the details, um, it's important to explain the steps that you'll take next. Uh, and if needed, set up a time frame to follow with them. Uh, we, we really don't want to leave anyone guessing at what comes next in this process. Uh, and then most importantly, be, be sure you are documenting these interactions. Um, you know, sometimes a complaint may come through a case manager and then it gets to the EO officer or they've talked to someone else in the organization. Um, and so it's always helpful to make sure that you're documenting who's had the conversation with them, when it happened, um, and getting as many details as possible from, from all of those interactions and having a good record keeping. So up next, um, we are going to cover some frequently asked questions and best practices. So I will turn it back over to Karen. 
How and how often does OWD recommend staff be trained on EO and non-discrimination requirements? New hires, subrecipients, board members, and seasoned staff members should be trained. All stakeholders should be well informed. Training is recommended for new individuals within the organization to ensure they understand the complainant process and their role if a complaint or potential complaint is disclosed to them. Where to find the complaint forms and the identity of the EO officer. When I was a local EO officer, we would meet with the subrecipients on a quarterly basis to review the local non-discrimination plan, which is preferred or required, electronic correspondence or physical mail. Complaints are required to be filed in writing. However, there is no requirement or preference regarding electronic or physical mail. Complaints must be signed by the complainant, but an electronic signature is acceptable. When should I involve legal counsel? Any complaint alleging discrimination may require legal counsel. This should be determined on a case by case basis. Most LWDAs have access to legal counsel in some form or another. The local eco opportunity officer should work with their supervisor to determine when and how to access those services when needed. OWD is available for technical assistance should you have any questions. However, OWD cannot provide legal advice. Let me provide an example. A customer would like to pursue an occupation that requires an advanced degree. The customer is not interested in obtaining an advanced degree, even though research indicates that an advanced degree would get the customer to the income level they desire. Services are denied. A customer files a written complaint that their rights have been violated due to their age. This is a programmatic suitability situation. However, a complaint has been filed and it must be investigated and resolved. This could be a case where legal counsel should be consulted. Loop in legal counsel to ensure your response to the customer, customer's complaint is appropriately addressed and clearly explained why services were denied. Uh, so the final question that we have um, in our PowerPoint today is when is a case considered resolved? And this, this is not as straightforward of an answer as it may seem. So I wanted to go over the different timelines for the various types of complaints um, and, and try to address this question in that way. So for general complaints, um, it, an individual needs to file that complaint not less than 120 days from the action that gave rise to the complaint. And then once that's been filed, the local area has to respond within 60 days. For complaints alleging discrimination, the timeline for the individual to file is 180 days. And then the re response from the LWDA needs to be within 90 days of that filing. And then of course, for complaints of suspected fraud, waste, abuse, misconduct, anything like that, um, per the policy that needs to be filed immediately with OWD the Georgia Office of Inspector General or the US Department of Labor's Office of Inspector General. So that, that third one is a little bit different. Um, but for the, the first two general complaints or discrimination complaints, um, from the local area perspective, once you've responded to that individual, that could potentially be the end of the issue. You know, Maybe that would be a satisfactory answer for that individual. And at that point, the case would be resolved. So for record keeping purposes, you'd start the clock for keeping those records um, at that point. However, um, for either of those situations, it may move into an appeals process or it could potentially escalate to another entity, either here at the state office or a federal entity, you know, if the individual's not satisfied with that um, response. And so, you know, if the complaint is unresolved because it's escalated to another agency, um, you, can you can close out the process on your end. However, if it's still active with another entity for record retention purposes, that clock starts from final resolution. Um, 
So that one's, it's a little bit tricky and it's gonna depend on each case and how it gets resolved. Um, but just be keeping that in mind um, that the record retention uh, requirements don't start until final resolution of the, of the complaint. So in terms of a best practice, what we really advise here is, you know, just make sure you have a good record keeping process um, and, and having that structured process in place and making sure you're documenting these dates of when complaints are filed, when you've responded, if it gets escalated to another agency, um, and just really paying attention uh, there. I, I recommend having some sort of tracker for these complaints. I think most areas do, um, but that, that seems to be the best way to keep track of these kind of moving timelines. So that concludes all of the content that we have for today's presentation. As we've mentioned a couple times, this slide has all of the links to the federal and state resources that are out there. Um, so I urge you to take a look at those if you've got any questions. And then here are the two PowerPoints that we mentioned, um, Equal Opportunity Policies in Practice. Um, most of you are familiar with David Dietrichs, who used to be with our office, um, has moved on to Miller and Martin, but he came and did a presentation um, on EO policies. And this one, because he's an attorney, it really cover, covers more of the um, legal requirements around it. Um, and that PowerPoint is available here. And then the EEOC pr um, presentation goes into more detail about the protected classes. If you're curious about any of that or want a refresher, um, I urge you to take a look at that presentation. And then finally, we've got um, our contact information here. As Karen mentioned, our team's general email is the WIOA compliance at tcsg.edu. Um, so that is something we encourage you to put with our contact information on your grievance forms. But of course, if you've got any questions, you can always reach out. Um, and then both mine and Karen's emails are listed here. Again, if you've got any questions, please let us know. We're happy to help. And that concludes our presentation.